Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at the first text in this course which is Rabindranath Tagore's The Prose Master. So we have already started with this text so we'll just continue from where we left off last time. So just to give you a very quick recap of what you've done, we, uh, we started to examine the setting of this particular story which is obviously a colonial Bengal, colonial India and we have this postmaster uh, from Calcutta who was stationed in his job in a place called Ulapur which is presumably a fictional place uh, which represents rural Bengal. And the entire story, I mean, the, the, some very symbolic things about the story, the sites are very important. For instance, the very side to the post office is a colonial uh, signpost as it were. And we have the indigo uh, plantation or the indigo, uh, you know, the in industry around the indigo plantation which is also a colonial site. So we have this colonial spaces, uh, uh, you know, alongside which the, the postmaster is situated. And we have the human subject negotiating with the colonial spaces around him. And the entire story is a very human story, obviously, about the alienation of a city person in a rural setting. And it's very, very empathetic bond that establishes with this little girl called Ratan. So, um, just to go back a little bit, the reference to Arabian Nights over here is interesting because we are told that uh, the postmaster tried his hands at, uh, in, in writing, in verse, uh, in poetry because he had no companion, so what's uh, so to say. But uh, we also told that if we had the choice, if we had the wish fulfillment uh, uh, option of getting rid of everything, he would have asked for the genie of Arabian Nights to get rid of uh, all the trees and leaves and everything around them and uh, replace those with, uh, with Macmadice Road, which is Pakka Road, uh, hiding the clouds and view with rows of tall houses. So. What we can see immediately in the story is that how uh, the geography in which you grow up uh, in, the, the physical locality, the physical setting in which you grow up in, informs your imagination to a great extent. So imagination would be considered to be an abstract thing, it is actually informed by material markers. So the entire aspiration, the, the almost the fantasy to see uh, Macamadized roads, which is Pakka Road, cemented road, uh, and tall houses. Uh, the imagination, uh, the the fantasy, uh, you know, which wants to see that those setting, is informed by the uh, the growth of this particular person or the uh, culture of this particular person, which is very very material in quality. The fact that he grew up in such a setting uh, makes him alienated in a setting which is very very rural and almost uh, idyllic in quality. Now uh, we are told that uh, he starts. Um, you know, he, he, we're about to see how the entire uh, economy of empathy begins to uh, brew between the postmaster and little girl called Ratan. And the companionship which they uh, uh, establish is very interesting because uh, it's, it's very parental in quality and the postmaster in a way is a father figure for the girl. But we also see how the girl uh, in turn nurtures him um, physically when he's ill. Uh, she nurtures him back to health, she nurtures him back to uh, normalcy. So she also becomes the mother figure for the post master. So the parental politics in the story is very interesting and is uh, in a way complex and reversible in quality. So we are told that uh, the postmaster's salary was very small, he had to cook his own meals, but he had a little girl called Ratan who would run errands for him, uh, who would do his old jobs for him here and there. And he in a way started teaching him, started making him uh, her literate. Uh, so she started, he started teaching her letters of alphabets uh, and then she picked up very, very quickly. So in a way that again becomes a mentor figure for the little girl uh, in that kind of setting, that kind of a rural setting. And we are told that uh, you know, Ratan's parents were, you know, were dead and she was an orphan essentially. And then you know, again that, that informs entire parental politics, the parental emotion, the effect around the parental emotions that a postmaster establishes with Ratan. Okay, so and then we, 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 we get to hear about the memory of the postmaster in terms of what he remembers uh, about his home, about his uh, alienation that he's experiencing over here, uh, cut off from everything around him. And in a very interesting way, this story is, uh, uh, is very interesting for us today because this is obviously about a time which is, uh, I mean, forget about internet, uh, pre-electronic communication, pre-telephone, where the only mode of communication were letters. 
So there are letters written by the postmaster, you know, there's a letter of resignation that he writes, there's a letter of re requesting a transfer that he writes later. Uh, but every mode of communication over here is through letters and a post office obviously is a symbolic site for the letters coming in and going. So the post office becomes uh, quite literally a material marker for communication. So that's the only site of communication or the space of communication over here. And ironically, the postmaster, uh, who's uh, presumably in charge of the post office, turns out to be the most uh, alienated person over here. So that becomes a very symbolic kind of a significant uh, significance, which is uh, the story, which the story uh, sort of dramatizes to a great extent. So we are told that on some evenings, and this should be on the screen now, on some evenings, seated at his desk in the corner of the big empty shed, the postmaster too would call up memories of his own home, of his mother and his sister, of those for whom in his exile his heart was sad. Memories which were always haunting him, uh, but which he could not talk about with the men of the factory, though he found himself naturally recalling them aloud in the presence of a simple little girl. So interestingly, uh, he doesn't manage to establish this bond with the men in the factory. I mean, they don't seem to understand his alienation. They don't seem to understand his emotional and existential uh, you know, solitariness. But for some reason, he finds himself opening up uh, and you know, empathizing and having a, establishing a dialogue with this little girl, Karathan, who is otherwise illiterate and very, very rural um, in her background. And so it came about that a girl would allude to his people as mother, brother and sister, as if she had known them all her life. In fact, she had a complete picture of each one of them painted in her little heart. So this is a very good example of what we call in literature as you know, the entire idea of uh, creating a world through stories, a world making through stories. Because what is happening here essentially is that the little girl Karatham, she is hearing or she is consuming the stories told by the Pierce Master about his family, about his mother, about his sister. And on consuming those stories, on consuming those characters, uh, true narratives, uh, she manages to make a world around them in a way that she plans to serve in that world. And she begins to refer to them, allude to them uh, as, as if they are her relatives, um, her kinfolk. Right? So this is a very good example of how we consume narratives and the process of consuming narratives, we establish um, almost an empathetic engagement with them. So the, the engagement of empathy is very, very interesting over here. She places herself in that position. Uh, she places herself in that narrative. So she plants herself in that narrative as it were. Uh, and in a sense, uh, she becomes one of them. She becomes part of the kinfolk, part of the kin structure of the Paris master. So one day during the break in the rains, there was a cool soft breeze blowing. The smell of the damp grass and leaves in the hot sun fell like the warm breathing of the tired earth in one's body. So again, if you look at Tagore's descriptions, they're very, very evocative in quality and how uh, the natural landscape and the, uh, the condition of the mind, the mindscape, so to say, are very, very interestingly dialogue with each other. So we have the image of uh, the tired earth and a cool soft breeze is blowing on the tired earth and a smell of damp grass uh, and the hot sun fell at the warm breathing of the tired earth on one's body. So the earth is obviously naturalized, humanized over here. The sun is uh, humanized over here as well and the leaves are humanized here. So every natural element over here is humanized and that it obviously establishes a companionship around the pure master. So in that sense, this is an example of what we call intersubjectivity. So it's a very intersubjective kind of an experience where everything is subjectivized, the sun is subjectivized, the leaves are subjectivized, the earth is subjectivized. And what we have in, in that process is a generation of an intersubjective situation where the postmaster is establishing a dialogue with all the natural elements around him. A persistent bird went on all the afternoon repeating the burden of his one complaint in nature's audience chamber. So again, a little girl, a little bird away, a persistent bird, a relentless bird goes on uh, crying. Uh, and you know, and if we take a look at this uh, description over here, it feels like it's a complaint to nature about the nature's audience chamber. So the, girl, the bird seems to be complaining about something. So what we see in the story is also a good example of focalization. So the dice story is focalized with the postmaster's imagination. So the postmaster is a focalized character. So we see everything around uh, uh, the, the setting over here through the postmaster's eyes. So it seems as if the, the little bird over here is complaining about something to mother nature and nature's audience chamber, right? So the postmaster here is the focal character, the focal point through which, through his imagination, through his prism, uh, through his cognitive prism, we see the rest of the story around unfolding uh, before us. 
the Purus Masa had nothing to do. The shimmer of the freshly washed leaves and the banked up remnants of the retreating rain clouds were sights to see, and the Purus Master was watching them and thinking to himself, Oh, if only some kindred soul were near, just one loving human being whom I could hold near my heart. This is exactly he went on to think what that bird was trying to say. Uh, that it was the same feeling with the which the murmuring leaves were striving to express. So again, look at the way, and this is what I meant when I said this is an example of intersubjectivity. Because what happens in intersubjectivity is we establish a subjective bond with everything around yourself. So it could be a bond between uh, animate and inanimate things. So you could have a bond between a human being and uh, leaves, uh, for instance. In this case, it's a bond between a bird, leaves, and a human being. And the human being imagines uh, this inter intersubjective quality and he seems to think that you know, everything around him uh, is also referring to things which he is thinking in his mind in terms of wanting a companion, in terms of uh, uh, you know, requesting a companion, in terms of wishing for a companion. Right? Uh, so the leaves and the birds, uh, the bird away, uh, also seem to uh, be completely dialoguing or overlapping with the postmaster's uh, fantasy or wish fulfillment uh, you know, imagination about having a companion to talk to. But no one knows or would believe that such an idea might also take possession of an ill-paid postmaster, ill-paid village postmaster in the deep, silent, midday interval of his work. The postmaster sighed and called out Ratan. Ratan was in sprawling beneath the guava tree, busily engaged uh, in eating unripe guavas. At the voice of the master, she ran up breathlessly, saying, Where are you calling me, Dada? Dada obviously means brother in Bengali, uh, which is a setting over here, rural Bengal. I was thinking, said the postmaster, of teaching her to read. And then for the rest of the afternoon, he taught her the alphabet. So we, we've seen how you know, the entire literacy program, the literacy uh, you know, endeavor in terms of the postmaster teaching the, the, Ratan, uh, the little girl called Ratan away, becomes a very human exercise of companionship, empathy and imagination. And Ratan obviously learns uh, education, she, she gets education in that in standardized sense from the postmaster. And for the postmaster, this becomes an excellent example, excellent opportunity uh, uh, for uh, imagination and empathy. Uh, and to have a companionship with a girl around him. Uh, because we are told that he cannot connect uh, in terms of wavelength and empathy with the people around him, the people who otherwise walk in the indigo factory. Thus, in a very short time, Ratan had got as far as a double consonance. Uh, double consonance are the complex consonance in Bengali. And she, uh, we are told she's a very quick learner. Uh, she's picking up consonants very, very quickly and she's gone to the double consonance very, very fast. It seemed as though the showers of the season would never end. Canals, ditches and hollows were overflowing with water. Day and night, the patter of rain was heard and the croaking of frogs. The village roads became impassable and marketing had to be done in ponds. So this is obviously a very, very uh, you know, typical example of uh, rain, typical example of monsoons coming in and everything becomes, uh, becomes inaccessible and uh, you know, uh, the village becomes almost flooded and you know, marketing or shopping uh, had to be done in ponds and intervals. So everything, we, we just keep hearing the incessant rain, uh, you know, the sound of rain, it's just uh, completely relentless and endless. And the village roads become, obviously they're not really pakka roads, they're not uh, macmadized roads as we are told at the beginning of the story. They're roads which were you know, just built ad hoc and not really cemented. So when monsoon comes, they become completely uh, ruinous, they're completely uh, unusable, impassable. And we are told that marketing had to be done in punts. Uh, so you know, we can always shop you know, periodically, we can't shop every single day because of the rains. One heavily clouded morning, the postmaster's little pupil had been long waiting outside the door for her call. But not hearing it as usual, she took up her dog-eared book and slowly entered the room. She found her master stretched out on his bed and thinking that he was resting. She was about to retire on tiptoe when she suddenly heard her name, Ratan. She turned at once and asked, Where are you sleeping, Dada? The postmaster in a plaintive voice said, I am not well. Feel my head. Is it very hot? So this is a point in the story where the climax comes, where the postmaster is uh, feverish and he falls very, very ill and uh, very seriously ill. And we also told constantly he's completely cut off from his companions, he's completely cut off from his family, from his kin. Uh, so the, the girl, the little girl away, the otherwise illiterate girl away, uneducated girl away, becomes a sole companion. And not just that, she nurses him back to health. Uh, so she performs the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the thing of the mother. Uh, the activity of the mother in terms of healing and nurturing the postmaster back to health and normalcy. So we're told that the plaintiff, uh, the postmaster, in a very plaintive voice, asks Rutten or requests Rutten to feel his uh, temperature of his forehead uh, and then say that, uh, and confesses that he's not feeling very well. 
In the loneliness of his exile and the gloom of the rains, his ailing body needed little tender nursing. He longed to remember the touch of the forehead of soft hands with tinkling bracelets, to imagine the presence of loving womanhood, the nearness of mother and sister. So we are told that look at the way in which uh, the entire idea of femininity is constructed in the story uh, through affective signifiers. The signifiers will affect the touch of the bracelet, the tinkling of the bracelet, uh, the touch of the finger. So all these little metonymy markers of uh, womanhood uh, you know, are constructed and, and dramatized in the story at this point, and you know, and he's longing uh, to get the touch, that touch, that touch of healing, the touch of love, the touch of nursing, uh, which you'd get from his mother and sister. But interestingly, this very conspicuous absence of the father figure in the story. The postmaster never seems to uh, refer to his father over here. It's always the mother and the sister who refer to. Uh, so he's an all female uh, figure in his imagination. There's no male figure as such that he's uh, thinking about or wishing uh, nearness to. In fact, all the other adult males that he uh, refers to or are referred to in the story are considered to be people who are not really sensitive, who are not really, um, you know worthy of commun communication, not really worthy of having a dialogue with uh, the, the workers in the Indigo factory, for instance. And the exile was not disappointed. Rotten ceased to be a little girl. She at once stepped into the post of the mother. So again, this is an entire performance of motherhood, which begins to happen from this point, where Rotten becomes the mother of the postmaster. She heals him back to health. Cole in the village doctor gave the patient his pills and the proper intervals, sat up all night by his pillow, cooked his gruel for him, and every now and then asks, are you feeling a little better, Dada? So she would just uh, completely devote herself in healing the postmaster, uh, uh, nursing him back to health. And she had the presence of mind to call the village doctor, and she'd cook for the gruel for the postmaster in terms of the, uh, the, the comforting food, the comfort food, which she would then feed him. And every now and then she'd ask him if he's feeling better. It was some time before the postmaster, with a weakened body, was able to leave the sick bed. No more of this, he said, he said with decision. I must get a transfer. He at once wrote off to the calculator an application for transfer on the ground of the unhealthiness of the place. So, you know, this is a point of the story where he is beginning to think of you know, moving out of this place. And obviously, Rotten doesn't know it. Um, so, the, the quality of dramatic irony in this point, uh, at this point, where we know it, the postmaster knows that he wants to go out of the story of this particular setting, but Rotten doesn't know it yet. So he writes a letter to the headquarters, presumably the upper office, uh, Calcutta being the center. Uh, all the headquarters uh, were placed in Calcutta at that point of time. Uh, an application is for a transfer uh, on the ground of the unhealthiness of the place. So, you know, medical grounds, unhealthiness of the place. These are some reasons cited by the previous master in terms of leaving the place, in terms of requesting a, a transfer. Relief from her duties as nurse, Rutten again uh, took up her old place outside the door. But she no longer heard the same old call. She would sometimes peep inside furtively to find the postmaster sitting on his chair uh, or stretched on, the, on his bed and staring absentmindedly into the air. When Rotten was awaiting her call, the postmaster was awaiting a reply to his application. So again, look at the two kinds of wait uh, described over here. Rotten is waiting for the call to come in just so she can start learning again. She can start the companionship with the postmaster again. Uh, and, but that process is interrupted, that, that performance, that, that exercise is interrupted permanently. The postmaster doesn't call her anymore. Uh, he instead is waiting for another call. He is waiting for a letter from the headquarters who will come back to him uh, and is hoping the transfer will be uh, granted to him. Right, so we have two different kinds of weight in operation over here. One obviously is a more human weight and the other is a more uh, official weight. Okay? Okay, so Ratan, we are told that she's waiting uh, for the call to come in and the postmaster is waiting for the call from the headquarters. So two different kinds of waiting are in operation over here. Okay? Uh, the girl read her own lessons over and over again. Her great fear was lest when the call came, she might uh, be found wanting in a double consonance. At last, after a week, the call did come one evening. With an overflow heart, overflowing heart, Ratan rushed into the room with her, where are calling me, Dada. So now this is a call and this is obviously a uh, there's an irony in this particular call, in the sense that uh, you know, she's waiting to get in and she thinks that a call has come to resume the lesson, resume the learning exercise again. But then we are told uh, very, very quickly that actually this is a point where the postmaster tells her that she'll be relieved of duty, and that he's going away somewhere else. And this is what he says to her. The postmaster said, I'm going away tomorrow, Ratan. Where are you going, Dada? I'm going home. When we come back, I'm not coming back. So there's a degree of finality about this particular section, and he informs her that he's not coming back. 
rather than ask another question. So this is an interesting point because there's a degree of break away, a break of communication. And the moment she finds out he's not coming back, it's never coming back. Uh, she ceases to ask any more questions. There's no more question asked at all. Rotten asks no other question. The purse master of his own accord went on to tell that her application, his application for a transfer had been rejected. So he resigned his purse and was going home. So we get, we get to know that the purse master, uh, as we told already, uh, had applied for a, a, a transfer, but that, that application had been rejected and he's instead resigned, so he's going home. He's probably going to apply for a new job, we're not told that, but there's a degree of finality about that he's resigned from the job. And we are told that uh, through the postmaster telling this to Okay, So there's a degree of conveyance of uh, information over here uh, in a very sophisticated and complex way through which we get to know this particular bit of information. For a long time, neither of them spoke another word. The lamp went on dimly burning, and from a leak in one corner of the thatch, water dripped steadily into the earthen vessel on the floor beneath it. So, you know, it's like a uh, slow motion in, in cinema where, you know, there's a degree of finality, there's a degree of uh, intensity which is created. And to convey the intensity, to convey the finality, everything slows down, everything is decelerated. And all we get to hear is the water dripping steadily into the earthen vessel uh, through a thatch roof. So, again, the use of natural signifiers is very, very interesting because those seem to be dialoguing with a human communication over here. So interestingly, throughout the story, you find this is one of the characteristics of Tagore's fiction that she uses the natural signifiers, the material markers uh, of nature around, whether it's leaves, rustling of leaves, or the pitter patter of rain, uh, or the dripping water from a you know, thatched roof into an earthenware vessel, all seem to communicate certain human emotions, all seem to communicate or convey certain human conditions, which are obviously uh, captured away here. Right, so the degree of stillness, interruption, uh, and all these are captured to this very, very, uh, the sound of silence, so to say, where water drips steadily into the earthenware vessel through the thatched roof. After a while, Rotten rose and went off to the kitchen to prepare the meal. But she was not so quick about it as on other days. So the degree of inertia has crept in. So she's dragging her feet, so to say, and she goes to the kitchen to make a meal. Uh, but she wasn't so quick about it. There's no energy and intensity left in her because she's resigned to the fact that uh, he is going away. So two, two different kinds of resignation are at work. Again, there's one official resignation, business-like resignation, and the other is more human and existential resignation. And we've seen earlier how two different kinds of weight are also in operation. One was official weight, a business-like weight, bureaucratic weight, other was more existential weight. But Rotten was waiting for the call to get in and resume her education. And we have different kinds of resonation at play here as well. Many new things uh, to think of had entered her little brain. When the postmaster had finished his supper, the girl uh, suddenly asked him, Dada, will you take me to your home? So he asks, she asks him suddenly, uh, can he take her to his home uh, in Calcutta? He, she wants to come with him uh, because, you know, and this obviously goes to show the, the degree of empathy, degree of companionship that had been established between this girl and, and, this, and this man over here, uh, which is parental in quality, but also very, very compassionate in quality. The first master laughed. What an idea, said he, but I did not think it was necessary to explain to the girl wherein lay the absurdity. So again, the whole question of absurdity is important over here. What's a perfectly reasonable question and uh, emotionally deep question for the girl seems to be completely absurd for the first master. And therein lies again, uh, we, we, we're seeing how, we are told how this is a mapping out of the city imagination, the urban imagination and the rural imagination. And we are told at the very beginning of the story that the postmaster felt completely like a misfit over here. He didn't uh, attune to this at all. So this question which came from the girl about you know the request to take her with him was a completely legitimate question a perfectly reasonable question from her end appears absurd from his end and again we have two different kinds of imagination at play over here the whole night in a waking and in a dreams the Pierce master's laughing reply haunted her what an idea so this uh, this derision that the postmaster had, had and, you know, conveyed through that laughter, uh, what an idea, and without giving any excuse, without giving any rationale, uh, that really taunted her and haunted her in her dreams. Uh, and this was a complete rejection uh, of any kind of companionship through that this one little laughter, the laughter of derision, the laughter and the, and the idea of uh, you know, absurdity through the idea, by saying what an idea, the exclamation of absurdity which the postmaster had expressed. Uh, that was a complete finality in terms of the break between the postmaster and Rotten. So that haunted her and that obviously was a major attack uh, to her senses, uh, attack on her imagination and a major insult and humiliation of any idea of companionship that she had nurtured with the postmaster. 
On getting up in the morning, the post master found his belt ready. He had stuck to the Calcutta habit of taking obedient water drawn and kept in pitches instead of taking a plunge in the river as was accustomed in the village. So again, we are told different kinds of bathing. One is more urban where you draw water from a pitcher and bathe them inside a bath stream, presumably in a closed space, whereas the rural way of bathing was to go to a pond and dip yourself into the pond in a more open space. And the postmaster had retained his ritual, retained his earlier urban habit of taking a bath inside a bath or using a pitcher. And I woke up in the morning and found the pitcher completely ready, perfectly prepared. For some reason or other, the girl could not ask him about the time of his departure. So it, she ceased to have any communication with him. She didn't even ask him at the time of departure. So we are told that she had got up really early, even before the beginning of dawn, and she had drawn the pitcher, she had filled the pitcher with water just to make it ready for him in case of needs uh, first thing in the morning. So she had fetched the water from the river long before sunrise and that it should be ready as early as he might want it. So, you know, we can see how she's avoiding communication, how she's evading the postmaster. And this being evasive, this avoidance of communication is obviously a reaction to the insult that she had uh, experienced in the postmaster, the reaction to the humiliation she'd experienced from the postmaster in terms of the derision and rejection that he had uh, sub subjected her to. After the bath came the call for Ratham. The, she entered noiselessly, again, very, very interesting, noiselessly, no interest, no excitement, nothing. There's a degree of deadness about a movement now, which is dragging her feet, and there's a degree of inertia which has crept in. Uh, she entered noiselessly and looked silently into the master's face for orders. So again, if you look at the language clearly over here, she's looking at the master's face for orders. Right, so she wants to be instructed, she wants to be ordered over here. And there's no human empathy left at all. There's a complete innovation of empathy, a complete depletion of empathy over here. And in so we have a very dried out and dried and cut out orders, uh, which is a master servant relationship that is to be retained. When she goes back, uh, she falls back into that structure because she realizes any kind of human emotion, any kind of human empathy uh, will be rejected outright and have been rejected outright by the post master. The master said, you need not be anxious about my going away, Ratham. I shall tell my successor to look after you. These words were kindly meant, no doubt, but inscrutable are the ways of the woman's heart. So again, we have this uh, male versus fem female um, you know, imagination at play over here, which is slightly binaristic in quality. Uh, but nevertheless, we are told that uh, the woman's heart over here, the girl's heart over here, was very, very different from the man's heart. And the man was talking about, uh, thinking about making things right for the girl, whereas the girl had been uh, experienced a complete sense of rejection from the previous master and she retains the rejection no matter what. So she refused to communicate, she refused to have any kind of communication with the previous master from this point beyond what is absolutely necessary. And that is a point in the story where communication takes a different turn. So we have a different kind of communication generated over here, which is not one of empathy, not for the human emotion or any kind of existential fulfillment, but strictly one of servant and master. So we stop at this point today and we conclude with the story in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.